Hi everybody, my name is Catherine Chan. I work as a Principal Economic Analyst in the Strategic Reform Branch at the New South Wales Ministry of Health. And today I'll be taking you through four case studies of how New South Wales Health applies economics to inform the development and the sustainability of value-based healthcare initiatives. Liz Hay, the Director of the Economics and Analysis Unit has also contributed to this presentation. So firstly, to set the scene, Value-based healthcare is a strategic priority for New South Wales Health, where we're striving to provide care that delivers across four dimensions of value, that being the health outcomes that matter to patients, the patient experience of receiving care, the clinician experience of providing care, and the efficiency and effectiveness of care. Value-based healthcare is about putting patients at the centre of care, shifting the focus from what's being done to patients to what matters to each individual patient. Value-based healthcare shifts the focus from volume to value. A key enabler of value-based healthcare is measurement, which includes monitoring, evaluation and economics to help inform decision making and determine if we are providing the best care that patients value. So economics is an important tool that we use to help measure the impact of value-based healthcare initiatives. And this slide shows how we use economics across the different stages of an initiative. So from the very start, economics helps us make decisions about how and where to invest. It provides that economic justification for implementing an initiative. During the life of an initiative, we undertake quarterly monitoring, we build economic models, assess activity benefits, undertake costing studies to really monitor and influence change. And importantly, economics is used in outcomes evaluations to measure the impact of an initiative across the four dimensions of value. So I'll be taking you through four case studies today, highlighting how New South Wales Health has applied economics to four leading better value care programs. Leading better value care, it's a suite of 13 clinical initiatives which have been implemented across New South Wales Health to really accelerate value-based health care across the state. One of the clinical initiatives is hyperfractionated radiotherapy for early stage breast cancer. And this initiative focuses on increasing access to hyperfractionation for women with early stage breast cancer. And the Cancer Institute of New South Wales is working to help New South Wales radiation oncology treatment sites increase their uptake of hyperfractionation to at least 90%. And to support the initiative, the University of Sydney worked with clinicians and New South Wales Health to undertake both a discrete choice experiment and economic analysis to see what an increased level of hyperfractionation, what, what the impacts of that would be. So firstly, the discrete choice experiment, it examined the factors that are likely to influence a woman's choice in choosing either hyperfractionation or non-hyperfractionation following breast conserving surgery. And some of the key findings were that for women aged over 50 years of age, they were more likely to prefer hyperfractionation over non-hyperfractionation, as these women placed more importance on not having to temporarily relocate. They preferred having shortish treatment times with less side effects. And we also looked at the preferences for women under 50 years old, and they had a preference for fewer treatment days, for less local side effects, and they also placed value on having fewer disruptions to their normal day-to-day -day activities. So by eliciting these preferences, the discrete choice experiment has been very powerful in informing how New South Wales Health can really frame the hyperfractionation initiative around these preferences to increase uptake of hyperfractionation by these cohorts. So an economic appraisal was also conducted, and it found that in addition to providing women with greater choice over their treatment options, there are also financial benefits for both New South Wales Health and patients. So this is in the form of lower out-of-pocket costs, less travel time, and improved productivity for patients. And for New South Wales Health, hyperfractionation, it's less costly than non-hyperfractionation, meaning we're able to generate additional capacity that can then be repurposed towards more hyperfractionation for nearly 1,700 women over the next decade. So the economic work has been very important in establishing the value of hyperfractionation and understanding the preferences of patients so we can frame the initiative around those preferences. <laughs> This next example is for renal supportive care. 
And renal supportive care, it's a multidisciplinary model of care that integrates renal and palliative care to support patients with chronic kidney disease, particularly those with end-stage chronic kidney disease, to live as well as possible. And some of some examples of the type of support offered include dialysis support to help manage the symptoms of kidney disease and conservative management for those patients who opt not to pursue renal replacement therapies like dialysis. So in New South Wales Health, we undertook an economic appraisal to understand the value of renal supportive care and using linked administrative data pulled from multiple data sets, such as the birth, deaths and marriages registries from the admitted, non-admitted and emergency department data sets, we measured the economic impact of renal supportive care. And we found that renal supportive care, it is generating benefits for both New South Wales Health and patients. And this is estimated to be worth around $275 million over 10 years. So for New South Wales Health, there are economic benefits from avoiding clinically inappropriate dialysis. And importantly, around half the benefits estimated were related to patients, where there are survival benefits estimated for of around 3 to 21 weeks, depending on individual characteristics. So the economic appraisal also modelled the cost and benefits associated with further rolling out RSC, and this information has helped guide service level agreements between ministry and the districts. So here, economics was used to help really demonstrate the value of an initiative and help with informing further expansion options for the initiative. The next two case studies have similar findings. So direct access colonoscopy, it seeks to provide direct access to colonoscopies for 50 to 75 year old patients who have had a positive fecal occult blood test result. And we used economic modeling to illustrate the case for change that if direct access colonoscopy hadn't been implemented, the cost of treating the cohort could total $700 million over the next decade. And then we used economic modeling to quantify the benefits of the initiative that the initiative is expected to slow the rate of growth in bowel cancer activity and also improve patient experiences by avoiding unnecessarily unnecessary pre-colonoscopy appointments. And these benefits after accounting for implementation costs are worth around $17 million over 10 years. And this creates additional capacity that can be repurposed towards more patient-centered care. The next slide is about the Leading Better Value Care Chronic Wound Management Initiative, which seeks to improve the way chronic wounds are managed and support a shift in patient care from the acute to not admitted setting where clinically appropriate. So the economic appraisal showed that by implementing wound management standards, the initiative is, is expected to generate positive economic benefits, even when only 10% of wound treatments are shifted from an acute to an non-admitted setting. And this is from reducing the rate of growth in hospital admissions, emergency department presentations, and readmissions associated with wound care, which this snapshot shows have been quite sizable in 2019. So both the direct access colonoscopy and the chronic wound management economic analysis, we used economic analysis to show that these initiatives are in a sense self-sustaining, that the upfront investments and implementation costs are expected to be outweighed by benefits in the longer term. And we've used the findings of the economic appraisal to help guide service level agreement targets between the ministry and districts. So putting it all together, from these case studies, I hope I've shown you that economics can help inform decision making. So in the examples I presented, the results of the economic appraisals have helped inform multiple policy decisions from informing service level agreements between the ministry and districts to providing an economic justification of why we should implement a particular initiative to demonstrating that the initiatives are generating benefits as expected. We found that the analysis is always the most powerful when it's patient focused. So, for example, with the discrete choice experiment for hyperfractionation, the findings around women's preferences have been used to frame how we can encourage its uptake by different cohorts. And finally, the economic appraisals have also shed light that new funding models might be required to fit these contemporary models of care. 
So a key focus of many leading better value care initiatives is to prevent hospitalizations, unnecessary hospitalizations, by providing care in a different non-acute setting. But the hospital funding framework doesn't always necessarily fit these new models of care well all the time. So overall, economics, it's a very useful tool in helping us make decisions about how and where to invest and to determine if we are providing the best care that patients value. I hope this presentation has been useful for you and please feel free to get in touch with Liz or myself if you have any questions. Thank you.